In this lecture, we're going to discuss pediatric pneumonia. Pediatric pneumonia is a, an infection of the lower airways of children. It typically presents with respiratory distress, hypoxemia, cough, and fever. In the entire world, it's actually the third leading cause of death of children. And it's a common cause in the United States of hospitalization. Most community-acquired pneumonia is viral. It's not usually caused by a bacteria. But distinguishing between viral and bacterial disease is almost impossible. 98% of blood cultures in children who we suspect of having bacterial disease are in fact negative. And a quarter of infants who are healthy will test positive for a virus by nasal PCR, which means that if we use a viral nasal PCR as a test, we're gonna get a lot of false positives. So what are the organisms that are most likely to cause pneumonia in children? Well, under three months of age, it's still likely strep pneumo, but in those children who were just a few weeks of age, it could be chlamydia trachomatis from the mother. Also from the mother, it could be group B strep or E. coli, or less common, but it can absolutely happen, is staph aureus pneumonia. In infants and children, the organisms are a little bit different. Still, among the bacteria, strep pneumo is the most common, followed maybe by H. flu and staph aureus. And mycoplasma pneumonia can happen in kids over five, is a little bit less common in kids under five. However, there are exceptions to that rule. There are a couple special circumstances we have to keep track of, though. Children who've traveled and have a long malingering disease might have tuberculosis. Children with cystic fibrosis might have Pseudomonas species. Children who've been exposed to Legionella could have that. And also fungal diseases are popular, especially in children with T-cell deficiency. Also, we're not sure, but perhaps Chlamydia psittacosis, Coxiella, various parasites, these can very rarely arise under very special circumstances. But generally, the bug we're most concerned about in terms of bacteria across the board is strep pneumoniae. Let's look at how children present based on their age. Neonates are more likely to present with nonspecific symptoms like fever, lethargy, or just apnea. Compared to infants who often have tachypnea, fever, cough, and very commonly abdominal pain. These children tend to have minimal upper respiratory infections. So minimal upper respiratory infections in the setting of pulmonary disease is more concerning for a bacterial illness as opposed to a viral illness. If a child has a lot of runny nose, it's more likely to be a virus. So what do we see on exam that's specific to community-acquired pneumonia? Well, the first and most important thing is rails. Rails, which is also sometimes, sometimes called crackles, is that high-pitched sound we hear on inhalation and exhalation in a focal point over some infected lung. Patients on percussion may have dullness to percussion. Patients may have areas where there's decreased aeration. You can't hear those breath sounds so well. And wheezes are more common in viral disease than they are in true low bar bacterial pneumonias. A chest X-ray in a well-appearing infant increases the risk of unnecessary antibiotics and does not necessarily distinguish between bacterial and the vastly predominant viral disease. What I'm saying is if you believe an infant who's relatively well-appearing has pneumonia based on your exam, you should not get a chest X-ray. Just treat the pneumonia. If that child has a question of pneumonia, but you have a reassuring exam, getting a chest X-ray increases antibiotic use without benefit. In other words, probably safe to assume they do in fact have a viral illness. The white count on a CBC in no way distinguishes between viral, viral and bacterial disease. It does not help at all. So there's really no role for a white count in distinguishing between viral and bacterial disease. Viral swabbing on the nose has a high false positive rate. So it's unclear that a child couldn't have a bacterial illness even if they have a positive nose swab. So that test is somewhat useless as well. 
So what is useful? Well, if a child is being hospitalized, it is important to get a chest x-ray. That's because there is an increased rate of complicated pneumonia, or pneumonia with effusion that's going on, and the chest x-ray can help you decide if you need to get, in fact, a chest tube in addition to your antibiotics. So it distinguishes between complicated pneumonia and uncomplicated pneumonia. It also distinguishes between bronchopneumonia and lobar pneumonia. A lobar pneumonia is very much likely to be a bacterial pathogen, whereas scattered patchy disease that's diffuse is more likely to be viral. Occasionally, the x-ray will pick up this complicated pneumonia we talked about. This is where pus has accumulated in the wall between the chest wall and the lung in the pleural space. In this x-ray right here, you can see that this pleural space is remarkably filled with a large amount of pus and it's going all the way up the side of the chest wall. That's something you want to look out for because this patient here is probably going to be treated differently than a patient who doesn't have this. So you want to know about antibiotics and what antibiotics should we choose. In order to make that decision, we have to make a few assessments. First, we need to know how sick is this child. If the child is going to the wards, or is staying in the outpatient setting, we're going to do very narrow-focused antibiotic. We don't need a broad-spectrum antibiotic, and we're willing to take some risk that maybe it's not it's, the bacteria is resistant to this antibiotic, maybe we need to ramp up our antibiotics later, but we're going to start with a narrow-spectrum agent. If the child is in the ICU and in sepsis, we're going to start with a broad-spectrum agent because we don't have the the time or the ability to wait and allow this child to get worse if, in fact, this is the unlikely case of a resistant organism. If we're choosing an antibiotic, we want to know, is this child likely to take oral medications? Amoxicillin, for example, is a good first choice for a pneumonia. Oral amoxicillin is delicious. Clindamycin tastes terrible. And if you're a two-year-old who's being forced to take their medicine, that may weigh into your decision. You may want to know what the resistance pattern, pattern is in your community. The reality is right now in the United States, we do not have very resistant streptococcal pneumonia. This is because of the way we've been vaccinating. So amoxicillin is working great in most places in the country. That's generally our first line agent. But if you have a lot of resistance, you might plan accordingly differently. You also need to know what are the side effects of that medication. So this is true for any antibiotic. We want to know, do we need to check levels, things like that. It might be easier to use a medicine with fewer side effects. Okay. Community-acquired pneumonia, our number one choice by far and away, is high-dose amoxicillin or high-dose ampicillin if they are hospitalized. This is a penicillin that is very effective against pneumococcus. As you may remember from basic science, Pneumococcus present, prevents itself from being killed by the penicillins by altering its penicillin binding protein. It does not create beta-lactamases. So adding sulbactam or amoxicillin plus clavulinic acid does not help in community-acquired pneumonia. By far and away, the best thing to do is to raise the dose and thereby attack those altered penicillin binding proteins. If a patient can't tolerate a penicillin or you're worried about resistance because of some spectrum of resistance in your community, you would maybe start with a third-generation cephalosporin. Other drugs that have been found to be effective are fluoroquinolones, but we, were, we don't encourage those because they have a black box warning. There are a number of side effects of fluoroquinolones that we want to avoid, like lifelong peripheral neuropathy. If a patient has a complicated pneumonia that is marked or a very, very sick appearance or an abscess in their lung, we'll probably add staph aureus coverage. This can be done by adding clindamycin or adding vancomycin in a very sick patient. For infants, we do use broader spectrum agents because remember these infants are prone to other infections like E. coli, which can get into lung. Lastly, we often will add azithromycin to infants under six weeks of age for concern over possible chlamydia trachomatis, but we'll test for that too through a nasal, nasal PCR. Can we prevent pneumonia? The answer is absolutely yes. So pneumococcal vaccine is an effective prevention against pneumonia and nationwide probably has resulted in a reduction in the rate at which this bacteria is resistant to antibiotics. 
Hib, or the Haemophilus influenza type B vaccination, has been amazing at preventing very severe pneumonia, which used to happen with Haemophilus influenza type B. I've never seen a case because of vaccination. Influenza vaccination is important in preventing pneumonia because it prevents superinfection that can happen after influenza. Same thing with varicella infection. It does reduce the likelihood of superinfection in the lungs that can happen after varicella. And don't forget, the DTAP vaccine does pre prevent pertussis, which can present with a pneumonia-like picture. So we have many vaccines that can prevent the likelihood of patients developing pneumonia.